what does the patient bring to the table? It wasn't long ago that I actually had an email conversation with um, Dr. Ted, who rocks, by the way, and um, he was upset because somebody had sent him an email that said, you know, I'm just so tired of these patient stories. All they do is come in and tell their story of grief and just leave it on our table and walk away. And maybe some people do, and that really is wrong. Because this is about communication, this is about working together. And what patients bring to the table is an amazing, amazing wealth of knowledge. Because like my husband wasn't the patient in 6218, and I wasn't the aggressive and suddenly upset wife, we were people. My husband had a PhD in film studies, and he was a really great guy in the neighborhood, and he worked at a video store for like 12 years, knew everything there was to know about movies, was a huge Stephen King fan, and wrote his dissertation on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> I am a poet, and an artist, and a mother, and I sold toys for a living for 12 years. And on top of that, I've taught art. And so I have this wealth of knowledge myself. And then we have two great children. I have a four-year-old who's amazing. His name's Isaac. And Isaac's just got a brilliant way of looking at the world. And like he says things like, we're going to do that latter day. And, like Latter day is a day that always exists, and it's always there for him. <laughs> and then there's my other son, and that's Freddie. And Freddie is 12 years old, and he's sweet and wonderful. And he is high-functioning autism. So it's the clinical description of what he has is PDD-NOS. It presents a lot like Asperger's, which is what you may be more familiar with. But if you look in the painting, 73 cents, that's what you see of Freddie. And there, you see him by the bed in the hallway, barely looking into the frame. And then, when you get to the entire painting, you barely see him at all. He's just a sliver. He's only an inch. He doesn't really matter, does he? But the way he was treated during hospitalization and through this entire process was massively offensive as a parent. And the way caregivers are treated and the way patients are treated is wrong and needs to be changed. It's those little details, the tiny, itty-bitty details that don't seem to matter that so much impact and affect care. You know, getting the pain meds on time is incredibly important. And also paying attention, is the IV actually in? Do we have an occlusion in the line? Is it only being silenced? Is this patient actually getting care? And how do we view these things from an autistic perspective, or somebody who's special needs, or somebody who doesn't understand what you're saying because they don't have the health literacy? Did you ask that second question to figure out where they were coming from? This is a wonderful panel from Health 2.0. I've been speaking about meaningful use and electronic medical records access for a year now. It's my major push. I truly believe that through patient empowerment and access to data, we can absolutely change everything. Because if you have access to the information, you are empowered, you are informed, you have the ability to change things. Without that access, you are completely denied a good view in the big picture of your care. So there's this famous slide of my husband's medical binder from the day that I met Ted on May 27, 2009, just three days before I placed my first mural, where we had this amazing meeting, because I was just this patient girl, and I had never heard about EMRs or high tech or um, all this. I never didn't even know what Pew Research Institute was. <laughs> and I'm sitting here for three hours taking notes at a Health 2.0 meeting, um, just si quietly sitting there. And then at 3 o'clock, I got to speak. And the room went silent because my husband was in hospice right then. The tragedy was right then going on. And this amazing group of people were like, Regina, what was the absolute worst thing that happened to you during all these horrific things that happened? And I said, the worst thing was not being able to get access to our own information. So here's a tale of two binders. That is my husband's medical record for one month hospitalization at a major state-of-the-art hospital. But this is my son's IEP record through many years of school. Because way before I was a medical advocate, I was a parent. And I was a parent of a special needs child. And because of the beauty of the Freedom of Information Act, I could see every single thing the day I requested it from my son's school. And I was part at the table of an IEP discussion, individual education plan, about what was the best ways to provide an education for this child. 
What can we do to make his experience the best? Accommodations must exist to help a patient or a child have the best experience possible. Accommodations do not exist just to facilitate workflow for the provider or for the teacher. This is a really important thing. I heard a lot about compliance yesterday. We don't want compliance. We want participation. You want the patient to own the medical experience. We don't accommodate a child in a special ed situation by putting them in the corner in a beanbag because that shuts them up so the teacher and the rest of the class can learn. We need to find a way for that child to learn, and that's what accommodations are all about. You know, for kids. Who's watched the Hudsucker Proxy? Yay! <laughs> Great film. So basically this guy, he's just a mailroom clerk, convinces a company they should invest in a plastic doohickus, um, you know, for kids. They would have fun. So partially coming to the show and deciding I was going to do a bunch of paintings, I was partially inspired by the hula hoop. I was also inspired by what circular things mean and the fact that my husband, who's massively claustrophobic, was forced into a closed MRI system four times while hospitalized instead of being able to transfer to a facility that had an open MRI. The solution was, since he was so very, very upset, we'll just double dose him with Ativan and just force him in there. After 15 minutes of almost completely seizing during that process, finally the tech, who I had begged initially to be allowed into the room, let me in to calm him down. But when he only had a few more days to live in life, one entire day was ruined by the fact that he was completely drugged out of existence. That is a poor accommodation. So if you look at this painting, we have a doctor in a hula hoop having a lot of fun. Got the headphones on, the eyes are closed. And the patient is not part of this data loop. It's a closed data loop. Over here, we have doctors playing double dutch and administrators jumping in the rope. And they're having a great deal of fun. But here, our patient, they've got a siloed PHR. Their data is not communicating with the hospital's data. Yes, this doctor can transfer information to that doctor. We've got the beginnings of a health information exchange. But our patient is not being involved. But there's hope. Over here, we've got Caring Bridge marrying Facebook with a Twitter bird in the background. And tin can phones coming down to those administrators. So maybe through social media, maybe through that back end way of communication, we can actually get people talking about all these things we desperately need to talk about. And then finally, what if we had a health information exchange that actually worked? What if doctors and patients and administrators and people were all together bouncing up data balls of information and working together toward common cause? If you'll notice stylistically, this painting is not finished. And it's on purpose because the system is not finished. Mommy, that hospital is like one of those blonde girls that seems so nice until they open their mouth. That's one of the things Freddie told me when we were in the hospital. It was so beautiful. It had the best couches. There were stained glass windows. There was art everywhere. But when they talked to you, it was like you didn't exist. That's Freddie in a painting when he was four. That's the kind of art I used to do. I used to paint children and book characters. I was a regular person. Nothing is as simple as black and white. When we make choices in life to disrupt, to radically disrupt, to change the system, it is hard and it is painful, and some feelings will probably get hurt. But we've got to decide what is life like without this. When Fred was sick and in the hospital. My little boy said, Mommy, you know, disease is a lot like that movie Pleasantville. At first, the color was only in that flower. <gasps> and then it was everywhere. Pop culture told my son that his father was dying. We were in the hospital, and he'd only been in a week. And the grief books told me, you've got to tell the child before the friends tell them. So we said, honey, um, you know, daddy's in the hospital. He handles these tests, but he has cancer. And my little boy just cried. He said, oh, I know that that's not good. I've seen those commercials race for the cure. That means there's no cure for cancer. And we sobbed together in the room. Many a 
time I saw a nurse or a doctor come in the room and ask my husband, what would you rate your pain? What's your number today? How much do you hurt? And he would say he was fine. Well, he wasn't fine. If they only took a second look at his face, they would know he wasn't fine. And this is the beauty of studying autism. We teach children how to look at faces and read them, and they can be taught. Children with serious neurological diseases can be taught how to read a face. And I'm just asking every nurse, caregiver, provider to do the same for our patients. Look at that face, ask that second question, how much do you really hurt? Those are wheels. Wheels are welts. And one of the best people at reading faces are people who've had a stroke or people who have been abused in their childhoods. I am really good at reading faces. And the one thing I would really want to leave you with is that we are patients. We are patients that watch Buffy and read Stephen King and have pop culture references throughout our lives. You know how my husband dealt with the fact that he was dying? He asked me to bring him his copy of Angels in America to watch again. That was his grief counseling. Sometimes we have to really consider what that patient needs and what will be the best for them. I wrote a poem about healthcare, and a few of you have actually heard it, and I'm sorry you will hear it again. But I think it's really important to think about what we bring as patients to this dialogue. Yes, it's important to learn technology and terms and, and sound like you know something about medicine, but also do not forget the amazing patient that you are and the person that came to that table and helped make these decisions. The wheels, the wheels, they are a turning. And past abuses do impress this fight. And thoughts of riots, rights, and rulings spin circles in the shadows of my mind. I go to sleep at night and I think of coding. Is our savior high within a data cloud? Is access to our care as great as knowledge? Where shall peacefulness be found? Does freedom lie within a soup of letters? Do EHRs and IEPs and EKGs and HIT open doors to our gaining knowledge? Is ARRA an acronym, or is it a primal roar? A raw, a rise, an EpiPen to stimulate the growth of understanding that we are all patients in the end. Here I take my stand. I can do no other. For past abuses do impress this time. And two by two, my Luthers tell me to demand my data rights, to be resolute, that separate is not equal, and that no man shall stand between me and the word. Is 1135 a page in the Annals of Oncology on Kidney Cancer? Or is it volume 113, number 5, Pediatrics, 2004, The Genetics of Autism? Or is 1135 simply, Jesus wept? I will see you in Galilee, Galilee, Galilee. I will see you in the ring and the circle and the circuit and these wheels, they are returning. The wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round. And Rosa parked. She refused to give up her seat at the table. I see D10, do you intend to save me from my coding? Do you entreat that we retreat and ask patients now informed and comprehending to sit idly by awaiting your decision? Physician, heal thyself, and let empowered patients speak and draw attention to those that seek a better and healthier tomorrow. Thank you.